Good evening and welcome to the 2023 stethoscope ceremony. My name is Corey Parashniku Rodriguez and it's my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm a 22 graduate of the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. I'm also a graduate of the Bloomberg School of Public Health and now I'm a PGY2 neurology resident here at Johns Hopkins. Um, I've had the fantastic gift of being able to engage in so many opportunities here at the School of Medicine within research, medical education, and advocacy with the Latino Medical Student Association and the Hopkins Source Center. Um, but among all of these experiences, receiving my stethoscope was such a significant transition point for me. It was the start of a journey that involved working with people during their most difficult moments um, and it is a very intimate world that you are allowed into. During your initial clinical experiences, you will be nervous. It is something that's very expected. At times, you will focus more on the work of medicine. You will spend hours uh, in a frenzy looking on up-to-date. You will practice your speeches for your consultants and lift the phone and, in you know, a wavering voice, you know, talk to them. Um, you will go over your HMPs for hours and hours trying to get it just perfect, and you will second guess your Tylenol order. And this is all part of the work of medicine. But the next part is going to be finding that joy that's going to fuel you and sustain you throughout the years. And that's where you really need to look for those intimate human moments that you will have with your patients. And today you are receiving the key to be able to unlock those experiences. Your stethoscope will help you bridge a gap uh, to help you move with your patients towards a relationship, not of strangers, but of a trusted confidant. And you will listen carefully to their story, identify that main concern that's really pl uh, plaguing them, that's really weighing on them, and you will have time to do that very thorough physical exam. And through that therapeutic touch that you do, you will show to your patients that you're taking care to really invest in that moment, to really try to reach through to them and build that trust. And in doing so, you're showing them that not only do you have that clinical knowledge, because they're, they're going to understand that you're in a process of building that but that you're invested in building personal knowledge about them. And that's where they're going to really trust you to make decisions about their care. Most people who come to, to us, to our hospital, will encounter a significant disease maybe a couple of times in their life. And maybe for our sicker patients, it'll be a couple of times a year. But they're not going to be exposed to these moments as much as you you will have some very clinically significant moments and some very clinically traumatic moments as well, daily. And that's something that both of you will have to navigate together. And by being able to work together to um, kind of go through those fundamentals of the history and the physical exam, you will be able to build that closeness that will not only nourish your patient, but will also nourish you. So, don't worry too much about all of the clinical knowledge building. You've been doing a fantastic job so far. You will continue to do that, and it will happen. Regardless of whether you want it to or not, it'll, it'll happen. You will have a wave of knowledge that, will, that you will absorb. But make sure that you're able to take that time to really invest in that moment with your patient, to do that thorough physical exam. They will make that space for you, and they will notice when you're being very careful um, and you will be, all of you, superb clinicians. Be brave um, and allow yourself the space to grow gently and thoughtfully. Okay, I wish you all so many beautiful moments. This is a very exciting time for you. Um, I'm going to move on before we proceed. I'd like to share a few brief instructions for you. First, please don't open your stethoscope boxes before you're instructed to do so. We'll all open them together when it's the right moment. And secondly, there are some blank thank you uh, cards and pens in front of you. Please take a moment during the program to write messages of thanks to our wonderful donors who have generously sponsored stethoscopes that you are receiving tonight. 
Um, and there is no need to address uh, the notes to a specific person, just dear doctor will, will be perfect. Um, I hope you all enjoy tonight and the speakers that you're about to hear from. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Bayef. Good evening. It's my great pleasure to be here to represent the Johns Hopkins Medicine and Alumni Association who sponsored uh, this event and sponsors it every year. Formerly, this was known as the Johns Hopkins Medical and Surgical Association, which became in 1940 when the Johns Hopkins Medicine and Johns Hopkins Surgical Associations merged. This does not mean that our interests or charges have changed. It was, the name was changed mainly to be representative not only of medical students and house staff, but graduate students and postdoctoral fellows as well. The numbers uh, that we have currently are about 35,000 members, and each of you will become a member of the Johns Hopkins Medicine Alumni Association when you graduate from the School of Medicine. And in addition to this, the Johns Hopkins Medicine Alumni Association provides funding for medical students graduate students and postdoctoral students. For example, we fund the uh, Medical Student Senate, the House Staff Council, the Graduate Student Association, and the Postdoctoral Association. In addition, we plan the alumni um, event in the June combined with medical meetings, and also at that time, we give awards to distinguished faculty, alumni, and former trainees. So now we're going to go on to the stethoscopes, which you're going to receive now. And there's certain advice that was put in by some of the donors. And I can, somebody is going to get a very special bit of advice, and that is from two of my grandsons. Uh, my daughter-in-law and uh, older son made a donation to the um, stethoscope ceremony because of me. Neither of them are physicians. And they asked my older grandson, Bert, uh, what he would recommend in terms of advice. And his advice was to have a lot of toys and learn to use teaser, tweezers. My, my younger grandson, George, who's two and a half, said, wear a hat and fix boo-boos. So I, I think that none of you really need any advice from us because you're such a talented and intelligent group that you will do fine no matter what you do. And I was reflecting on this uh, when I was in your seats as a first year medical student. I'm a graduate, 1974. And Dr. Daniel Nathans and Dr. Hamilton Smith were teaching us microbiology. And they were teaching us things that were not in any textbook. It was their research, which involved DNA ligases, which cleave DNA at certain specific points. And for the life of me, I couldn't understand it was, it was very interesting, but I couldn't understand what the point of this was. So n nine years later, when I was a hematology oncology fellow at Columbia Presbyterian, I was watching the NBC Nightly News with um, uh, great interest, and uh, Chet Huntley and David Brinkley were the commentators, and this was the World News, and they said, and now the Nobel Prize in Medicine is awarded to Dr. Daniel Nathans and Dr. Hamilton Smith from Johns Hopkins for their pioneering work in DNA ligases. And of course, I had known by then what the import was. And, and really, this was one of the milestones. This enabled so much development in biomedical research. We wouldn't have uh, monoclonal antibodies. We wouldn't have so many things uh, without their efforts. And I think, uh, as you know, uh, the, one of the colleges, I obviously you know his name for uh, Dr. Nathans, who was a, a tremendous inspiration to us. My own class, was extremely talented, and two of them are still here. You may come into contact with them. Dr. Peter Agre, who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for describing aquaporins, and Dr. Bert Vogelstein, who uh, is one of the most referenced scientists in the world, actually, and his pioneering research in um, the basic science of cancer has been uh, fundamental and has changed many of the things that we do and he's become an extremely important scientist who's won many, many uh, awards, and we're still waiting for him to receive the same prize. Um, 
I, I know that you all are going to do tremendous things. I, I can't even imagine what you're going to accomplish. All I know is that the world's going to be a better place because of you. And I, when I think about what we didn't have in 1974, we didn't have CAT scans, we didn't have PET scans, we didn't have MRIs, there was no laparoscopic surgery, we didn't have, oncology was just coming in. There was one oncologist at the Johns Hopkins Hospital who they banished to the city hospital because they didn't think there was any future in treating cancer. Um, and uh, things have, have really changed. Um, I, I would echo the thoughts about the stethoscope. I think now we're all engaged with imaging, with MRIs, and uh, uh, everybody gets an echocardiogram if they have a, a murmur, but uh, touching the patient and examining the patient remains uh, fundamental. The last thing that I, I, I would recommend to you is that while you're here, try to learn as much as you can about the history of the Johns Hopkins Hospital and medical school, because it's a history really not only of American medicine, but really of medicine throughout the world. The changes that have come because of this institution are, are unbelievable. And uh, if, if you want to read a book, if you have any spare time, one of the things that I, I would recommend is the, the Great Influenza, which is a telling of the 1917-1918 uh, influenza epidemic. And the first 75 pages are essentially uh, a history of the Johns Hopkins University Medical School and Hospital and the Rockefeller in New York, which were the two premier institutions uh, of science at the time. And uh, that, that's about all the advice I have for you. As I say, you really don't need any advice. You just need to be guided. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Roy Ziegelstein, who's the Vice Dean for Medical Education and a tremendous advocate for students, house staff, and postgraduate trainees, and a tremendous human being. Hey, what a great night this is, really. And uh, I think you all sense it. I could see the energy uh, as you were coming in. Um, this is one of my favorite nights of the year. Um, I, uh, uh, as you heard, I'm Roy Zielstein, Vice Dean for Education. I I'm gonna really do three things in comments, although none of my comments will be as profound as the comments of Dr. Bayev's grandchildren. Um, <laughs> You know, so I guess I should start by saying wear a hat and uh, fix a boo-boo. Um, <clears throat> but I'm, gonna, I'm going to tell you a story first, and then I'm going to um, give you a little bit, a very little bit of data that kind of relates to the story. And then we're going to open our stethoscopes, and I'm going to show you a little bit about how to use it. Does that sound okay? Okay. So um, I think this story is true because I read it on the internet. And, and if it's not true, it really should be, but I, I think it's true. It is reportedly true. A man and his wife went to a party. The, the man was nervous because he was meeting all of the coworkers of his wife at this, this party. It was, a, it was a work party. And as the night, you know, came, he, he became more and more nervous. And to combat his anxiety, he decided that instead of trying to impress people, he was just going to listen. And so at the party, he, he listened carefully to everyone who spoke uh, to him. He never interrupted. Occasionally he would say, yeah, I, I understand. Um, or sometimes he would say, you know, can you explain that again? Um, <clears throat> but he never said anything about himself and he actually never voiced his opinion about any of the topics that were being discussed. On the way home, his wife, who actually didn't know that he had done this, said to him, you know, a lot of my coworkers came up to me and <clears throat> they were so impressed by you, they thought you were phenomenal. They, they said things like, he's so charismatic. And, and another person said that you were the most articulate person she had ever met. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm not going to interpret the story for you, but, but I will tell you that I'm starting my comments with a story about listening because, in fact, you're going to learn how to listen with your stethoscope, but that's not the most important listening that you'll be doing as a physician. So I'm, I'm leaving the story out there for you to interpret. Now, I'm going to take out... 
another device. It's called my phone. I'm going to put it on the clock setting, and I want to show you something. Hi, my name is Roy Ziegelstein. I'm, uh, I'm married. I have three children. I work at Johns Hopkins. I'm a cardiologist, and that was 11 seconds. Now, why did I do that? So a recent poll showed that 87% of doctors, 87% of doctors think that they do a great job listening to their patients. Around the same time that that poll was taken, an article appeared in the Journal of General Internal Medicine and it showed that physicians interrupted their patients on average after 11 seconds. That's the length of time it took me to tell you just some very basic information about myself. Now, that study is noteworthy because it turns out it suggests things are getting worse, not better, because there are many, many studies in the literature that date back now almost 60 years that have looked at this question of doctors interrupting patients. And they, you know, they've said on average doctors interrupt patients 16 seconds, 18 seconds, 20. This is 11 seconds. It's getting worse. Um, so I mentioned the story of, about listening and, and interrupting and the importance of listening because, again, the stethoscope is just a device that will help you to listen. But I will tell you the truth. As a cardiologist, and I'm a cardiologist, um, I make many more diagnoses by listening to patients without my stethoscope than I do by listening to patients with my stethoscope. So, Again, I feel okay by introducing the stethoscope, by talking to you about the importance of listening. Now, I will tell you that more than a decade ago, um, one of the most famous cardiologists in the country, Eric Topol, who trained here at Hopkins in our fellowship, he was speaking to a group of, of people like, like this, and um, he was demonstrating the use of this device, which is, believe it or not, a portable ultrasound. I, I use it all the time when I'm seeing patients. As you can see, it's about the size of an iPhone, maybe a little bit bigger. It has a transducer here. Um, and I can get phenomenal images of the patient's heart. Really very accurate. Um, I can look for pericardial effusion. Things that really are very difficult to do by physical exam alone. Um, but I, I want to tell you that what Dr. Topol said at that time, which is, quote, why would you listen to a heart when you have an ultrasound in your pocket? I think that's a, a, a terrible and terribly wrong statement because um, I'm happy to share with you examples of when the diagnosis of the patient was revealed, again, by listening just to what they were saying, listening with the stethoscope, and not the echocardiogram. So I want you to know that the stethoscope that you're about to get and open is really, really important in terms of making diagnoses, and your patients will want, to, want you to have that hands-on approach to them. So embrace technology, for sure. Don't, don't run away from it. But it doesn't supplant the use of other things in the physical exam. OK. You can now open your box. Now, I, I, as you're opening your box, try to, try to do two things at once. Open and, and listen to me. Try to practice. Try to practice what I was trying to teach you a minute ago. All right, 11, 11 seconds. Um, so I, I want to tell you, first of all, you, you have a really, really high-quality stethoscope that the Alumni Association got for you. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you how to use it, okay? Um, I have the Littman Cardiology 3. You have the Littman Cardiology 4. <laughs> That's important because the, the acoustic properties of the Littman 4 are even better than the, than the properties of the Littman 3, which is the stethoscope I use every day when I see patients. Okay, so you, you're getting a really good device. Okay, first of all, the end that goes in your ears is this end, <laughs> not this end. Okay, you can try putting this end in your ears, but it won't work. You'll, you'll notice that the, the ear end is angled slightly because most people's 
ear canals, if you will, are angled this way, forward. So you put it in with the angle facing the front or facing the patient, if you will, okay? I'm not gonna actually do it because then I can't hear anything. These, these actually, these little, um, you know, things at the end, we call them things at the end, that, that, that you have like on your AirPods and so forth, these are actually really well designed. They, they reduce ambient noise much better than the old versions of stethoscopes, okay? The tubing is actually really cool and much better, I will say, than my old device because the old device that I had and, and used for many years, the, the rubber, um, it tends to crack with heat and use. This won't do that. This is really um, awesome, okay? Um, you'll see that there are two ends here, one that's larger than the other. And the Lippmann cardiology stethoscope is, is, from my perspective, really cool because it doesn't really have a diaphragm and a bell. And let me explain what I mean by that. Old stethoscopes, older stethoscopes, and even some current ones have a flat end like this. We call that the diaphragm. And then they have an open end that does not have a membrane at the end, does not have a diaphragm, that's called the bell. If you want to remember one thing, here it is. When you use the diaphragm, that's good for higher pitch sounds, like the second heart sound is a classic example of a sound that's heard very well with the diaphragm. The bell is heard, it listens very well, or allows you to hear very well lower pitch sounds, like a third heart sound. So, You've heard the, the expression lub-dub, lub-dub. Lub-dub is S1, S2. Lub is S1, dub is S2. And, and the heart sounds like this, boom, 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 boom. And then sometimes in certain patients, especially patients who have weaker hearts, there'll be a third sound that's lower pitched. It will be like this, boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom. And the bell is very good at hearing low pitch sounds. The reason this is so cool is you don't even need a bell. You, you basically use the stethoscope and vary the pressure on the chest. If you just lightly apply the stethoscope to the patient's chest, you're listening with the bell. And so you'll hear lower pitch sounds. If you just apply pressure, gentle pressure, gentle, okay, be gentle, it will convert that bell into a diaphragm, okay? Why do you have two ends of your stethoscope? Basically, the smaller one is meant for kids. You can use it for other things like listening to the carotid artery. Sometimes you can listen around things like if the patient has bandages or EKG leads. But in general, you, you really only need one end for adults and one end for kids. Now, this is, again, really, really cool because if you want, if you, if you want to convert the smaller diaphragm into a bell, an open bell, you can actually just take off the membrane and it converts to an open bell, but you don't need to do that. So when you get home, practice on yourself, listen to your heart. If you don't hear anything, there are two possibilities. Really, there, there are three possibilities. One is, you're heartless. But, but, but we know that that's not true because you're a medical student here and, and we recruited you because you have a heart. So I'm discarding that differential diagnosis. The second possibility is, you, you're just not hearing. That's not, that's, that's, that's not the case. The real reason probably is that you're, you're listening with the wrong end. So, this end rotates, okay? You, you cannot, because of the way this is designed, you cannot simultaneously listen to both ends. So if you just put your stethoscope in your ears for a minute and tap on one end with your finger, just tap, okay? If you don't hear anything, it means you need to rotate the top. You follow? So if you're tapping on the big end and you hear something, it means 
it's open to that end. Okay, and in fact, if that happens and you tap on the smaller end, you'll hear nothing. You understand, you can't open them both at the same time, but all you need to do is rotate, and now the smaller end, you'll hear something, and the larger end, you won't. So that's how you, that's how you play around and practice. The last thing I'm gonna tell you, and I'm, I, by the way, you're gonna learn so much in, in CFM about listening to this with the stethoscope. I'm happy to teach any of you more, uh, Love to have students in clinic with me and so forth. The last thing I'll tell you is this, and then I'm going to turn things over to Dean DeWeese. Um, I bet that many of you who've been to a doctor have had your heart or your lung examined through a shirt or a blouse, maybe even through a sweater, maybe even through a down parka if you're from Minnesota. Okay? Um, that's bad, okay, because no matter how good your stethoscope is, if you're listening through something else, you're not going to hear very well. So, two pieces of advice. A, put the stethoscope on the patient's skin when you're listening, so you actually hear what, what the heart is saying to you. And when you speak to patients, don't put artificial things between you and the patient that distract you, like a computer screen or something like that, basically the down park equivalent. Listen to your patients and listen to them carefully and authentically. It's a pleasure to introduce you to your stethoscope and to our dean, uh, Dr. Ted DeWeese. Hey, good evening, everyone. You got the Litman Four. That's like the Nimbus 2000, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. And I still have my uh, Lippmann scope from medical school. Um, I, and it, this is such a wonderful day. I think I've said it to some of you individually. I think I said it collectively in a video that I provided because I wasn't here. But um, welcome to your home of Johns Hopkins. And as, uh, as we heard a minute ago from Peter, this will always be your home. You'll always be part of the Johns Hopkins family, and that is a great family to which to belong. So welcome to you. I think you heard in the voices of my colleagues um, really the passion that both this night represents and um, what it means on your path to becoming physicians. You know, there's a lot of things that, you know, who cares about tradition and history. Tonight is one to think about tradition and history and the purpose on your path to becoming a physician. It is really very important. As uh, I think all the colleagues said, and Roy does in such a wonderful way, despite contemporary medicine and all the things Peter talked about, scans and et cetera, et cetera, one, you actually will use the stethoscope. It really does matter, but I just reemphasize it's that um, most tangible link in a very vulnerable moment for patients who are coming to you. These are people you don't know, they don't know you, and within moments, they let you into the most, at times, intimate portions of their life. You don't know them at all, and you're now touching them. All the things that you'd be arrested for on the street, you get to do. That sounds, I didn't, that didn't come out like I had hoped there, actually. <laughs> but, um, sorry about that. Um, I think you got the point, I'll just stop there because that's, that just didn't go well. But, but the, uh, that laying of hands on, and as Roy talked about, the listening to a patient, beyond the value it provides to them, and that is unequivocal, think about the value it provides to you. And I think all of my colleagues would just tell you how wonderful that relationship is uh, and the honor and the privilege of being able to help people in the most um, difficult, at times, portions of their life. It is a wonderful thing. Uh, so I hope you listened closely to Dr. Ziegelstein about the orientation of the cushions on the earpiece. Point them towards your eyes, not the other way. So I got the scope, my Lippmann, I think it was two. I don't know, it's been that long ago, Roy. And there I, so I've been in anatomy and we're like working so hard. I'm very, very tired, but we got the scope. I'm all pumped up about it. I go home, 
No one tells me that we didn't have a Royal Ziggle, Zig, Roy Ziggelstein. I put him in the wrong way, and I'm laying on the bed like, what in the heck? I don't. And I've been working so many hours, I fell asleep. <laughs> and I'm don't, I don't know exactly how long I was there. Probably at least an hour, probably two hours. And my uh, partner, now my wife, came home and startled me, wake me up. And all of a sudden, I pulled out, and oh my God, my ears were in such pain because they'd been in my ear for more than two hours in the wrong orientation. So when Dr. Ziggelstein, one, gave you the instructions of the right orientation, and he said, listen tonight, yes, right orientation, listen tonight. I would not suggest for like two straight hours because um, you'll end up looking like this and therefore needing the hat that Peter's grandson suggested that you need. Um, my only other suggestion to you on such a wonderful night like this is, um, look, all of us who are in this room uh, got here with the help of a lot of people and of course your sheer will and intellect. There are many folks, um, and I'll speak for myself, who get on this and it's like a railroad track in medical school from college to med school. And you know what? It isn't about continuing to that next rung. It's not, savor the moments like tonight with all your friends and colleagues. Savor the times, as Dr. Rodriguez said, with your patient. Go slow, it's okay. It's about the experience. And if you do savor that and not worrying about just having to ace every course, et cetera, the, that mode that we have tended to get into, both your career here at Johns Hopkins, but your overall career will be so much better. So I want to thank Peter specifically and the Johns Hopkins Medical uh, Association for the hopefully honor and privilege that they feel I'm sure right now of receiving these scopes. I know on behalf of all of the school and the colleagues, I appreciate it very much, Peter. It is a wonderful, wonderful gift that will continue to give to thousands of patients afterwards. So thank you for that, Peter. So uh, from them to us and from us to you, thank you. Uh, I really want to thank you all for who you are now and who you're going to become. You're going to be the best representatives of the mighty Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. You belong here. We want you here. And you're going to be succeeding in ways that I think, as Peter noted, are really unimaginable. And uh, for all of us, thank you in advance for that. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Rodriguez. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Deweese. Um, so for everybody, thank you so much for being with here, to, uh, being here with us tonight. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers. And now just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, for those thank you notes, if you could please just leave them on the table in front of you, we'll come by and collect them a little bit later. Um, when you exit the auditorium, please head up the stairs uh, up to the atrium for a buffet dinner uh, so we can all celebrate this moment. And there's also a photo booth available if you want to just capture all of the wonderful memories that you're gonna to have tonight. We hope that you've enjoyed the evening. Thank you so much for being here with us with the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine Alumni Association. We wish you all the best. Bye everyone.